All right. The last week of actual class. Next week we're watching a movie. So we have finished the book, right? We finished the book, right? Okay, great. So uh, the last set of discussion questions. Question one, what do you think Mrs. Smith's key role in the Mr. Elliot plot might say about the rigid class distinctions of that society? We know that Mrs. Smith is from a lower class. Number two, why do you think judging a person based on their private correspondence is a violation of the laws of honor? Correspondence here just means mail. Number three, Anne thinks of herself and Captain Wentworth that if there be constant attachment on each side, our hearts must understand each other ear long. Ear means before. We're not boy and girl to be captiously irritable or like randomly angry, misled by every moment's inadvertence. Inadvertence means twist and turn. And wantonly or arbitrarily or like a follow, a willfully, I believe, uh, playing with our own happiness. Do you agree? Why or why not? Number four, in the end, Anne believes that she was right to refuse Captain Wentworth the first time. Do you agree? Why or why not? And number five, do you think everyone gets their just desserts at the end? Do their endings fit what they deserve? Why or why not? How would you describe the morality of the ending? Um, so let's look at question one, and I just realized I forgot to open the novel. Hang on. Okay, so the Mrs. Smith plot. This is really interesting. Uh, in the film, it simply says that Mr. Elliot is not rich. But in the novel, there's much more sinister things afoot. See if I can. Oh, wait, not 24, sorry. Uh, chapter 21. OK, so let's see. Uh, so right, so um, on page 129, Anne tells Mrs. Smith I am not going to marry Mr. Elliot. I should like to know why you imagine I am. Uh, and then after Mrs. Smith is entirely sure that they're not going to marry, then Mrs. Smith tells the truth about Mr. Elliot. Uh, let's see, where where is it? OK, so starting on page 132. Hear the truth, therefore, now while you are unprejudiced, while you have no bias toward Mr. Elliot or against myself. Mr. Elliot is a man without heart or conscience, a designing, which means full of plans and schemes, manipulative, wary, which means very careful, cold-blooded being who thinks only of himself, who for his own interest or ease, ease here means comfort, would be guilty of any cruelty or any treachery, which means betrayal, that could be perpetrated without risk of his general character. He has no feeling for others. 
those whom he has been the chief cause of leading into ruin, he can neglect and desert without the smallest compunction. So when he leads other people into ruin, when he ruins people, he can just walk away and not feel a thing. Compunction means guilt. He is totally beyond the reach of any sentiment of justice or compassion. Oh, he is black at heart, hollow and black. <laughs> wow. So why does Mrs. Smith uh, feel so strongly about this? Um, here is where Mrs. Smith tells the story. Facts shall speak. He was the intimate friend of my dear husband who trusted and loved him and thought him as good as himself. So her husband, now dead, thought that Mr. Elliot was like himself a good man. The intimacy had been formed before our marriage. I found them most intimate friends, and I too became excessively pleased with Mr. Elliot and entertained the highest opinion of him. To entertain a, an opinion just means to have an opinion. A high opinion means a good opinion. At 19, you know, one does not think very seriously. So this tells us that Mrs. Smith at the time was just 19 years old. But Mr. Elliot appeared to me quite as good as others and much more agreeable than most others, and we were almost always together. We were principally, which means mainly, in town, living in very good style, which means like living a high quality lifestyle. He was then the, the inferior in circumstances. He was then the poor one. Compared to Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Elliot was not as rich. Um, so at this point, it looks like he's a good man. Um, Let's see, where is the truth? There we go. Okay, so the next page, 133. Mr. Elliot, at that point of his life, had one object in view, only had one goal, to make his fortune, and by a rather quicker process than the law. Uh, so he was studying the law at that time, but he is impatient. He was determined to make it by marriage. He was determined, at least, not to mar it by an imprudent marriage. So his primary goal at the time was to find a good woman to marry, hopefully a rich woman, uh, but at least not to marry the wrong woman. Um, and I know it was his belief, whether justly or not, of course I cannot decide, that your father and sister in their civilities and invitations were designing a match between the heir and the young lady, and it was impossible that such a match should have answered his ideas of wealth and independence. So at the beginning, they were uh, Sir Walter wanted Mr. Elliot to marry Elizabeth, but Mr. Elliot thought this would not be a good enough marriage. Uh, it had wealth, but it did not have independence. Notice that at that time, independence was spelled with an A. Today, we spell this with an E. Uh, and um, Mrs. Smith knows this because Mr. Elliot told her. Um, so instead... See, where is this? Mr. Elliot married completely for money. Her father was a grazier. Uh, I believe that's a glass worker. Let's see if I remember that. No, feeds cattle for market. So a lower class occupation. Yeah, a glass worker is a glazier, not a grazier. Sorry. Um, her grandfather had been a butcher, Tufu, someone who kills animals for meat. Well, that was all nothing. He didn't care, as long as she was rich. She was a fine woman, beautiful, 
had a decent education, was brought forward by some cousins, so was introduced to Mr. Elliot by some family members, thrown by chance into Mr. Elliot's company, fell in love with him, and not a difficulty or a scruple, a scruple is a hesitation, was there on his side with respect to her birth. So he really did not care that she came from a lower class. All his caution was spent in being secured of the real amount of her fortune before he committed himself. So he was primarily focused on making sure that she really had as much money as she said she did. Um, so that's the only thing he cared about. So he married her. Um, and then Mrs. Smith gives proof. She pulls out a letter that Mr. Elliot wrote uh, about his situation at that time. This is a letter from Mr. Elliot to Mr. Smith. Dear Smith, this is on page 135. I have received yours. I received your letter. Your kindness almost overpowers me. Uh, so in the previous letter, Mr. Elliot had asked to borrow money from Mr. Smith. So here he's thanking Mr. Smith. Your kindness almost overpowers me. I wish nature had made such hearts as yours more common. Blah, blah, blah. Like uh, brown nosing him. Pai Ma Pi. At present, believe me, I have no need of your services being in cash again. So I asked you for money, but now I have a different source of money. Give me joy. I have got rid of Sir Walter and Miss. Talking about Elizabeth. They are gone back to Kellynch and almost made me swear to visit them this summer, but my first visit to Kellynch will be with a surveyor, uh, someone who measures the land, to tell me how to bring it with best advantage to the hammer. The hammer is the auction hammer. So the only reason Mr. Elliot will go back to Kellynch is to find out how much he can sell it for. The baronet, Sir Walter, nevertheless, is not unlikely to marry again. He is quite fool enough. If he does, however, they will leave me in peace, which may be a decent equivalent for the reversion. So if Mr. Sir Walter does marry someone else and they have a son, Mr. Elliot would no longer be able to inherit Kellynch. But here he's saying it might be worth giving up the value of the land if I could just get rid of them, the people. Just completely heartless way of talking about them. He is worse than last year. I wish I had any name but Elliot. I am sick of it. The name of Walter I can drop, thank God. And I desire you will never insult me with my second W again. So his name is William Walter Elliot. Meaning for the rest of my life to be only yours truly, William Elliot. So yeah, this is proof. Mr. Elliot really does not care about the Elliot family name. Uh, and we're moving directly into question two, right? Because Anne, this is a private letter. Anne could not immediately get over the shock and mortification, which means embarrassment, of finding such words applied to her father. The word mortification is very interesting. Mort means death. So we have the word mortal, which means someone who will die. Mortification, therefore, you can translate as wanting to die or feeling like they're going to die. Uh, in Chinese, we might say She was obliged to recollect, to remember, that her seeing the letter was a violation of the laws of honor, that no one ought to be judged or to be known by such testimonies, this kind of evidence, that no private correspondence could bear the eye of others before she could recover calmness enough to return the letter which she had been meditating over. So this will be the focus of question two. Why? Why is it a violation of the laws of honor to read other people's private letters without permission? Um, and then Ms. Mrs. Smith continues with the story. 
Um, and part of the story comes from Colonel Wallace. Again, this is the source of Mrs. Smith's information that Anne could marry Mr. Elliot. Colonel Wallace talked about it to Nurse Rook. Nurse Rook passed it on to Mrs. Smith as gossip. As it says here, Colonel Wallace has a very pretty silly wife to whom he tells things which he had better not, and he repeats it all to her. She, in the overflowing spirits of her recovery, uh, she's the sick person, repeats it all to her nurse. And the nurse, knowing my acquaintance with you, very naturally brings it all to me. And the nurse, of course, is Nurse Rook. Um, let's see. So if you remember, Anne ran into Mr. Elliot in Lyme. He saw you at, then at Lyme and liked you so well as to be exceedingly pleased to meet with you again in Camden Place as Miss Anne Elliot. And from that moment, I have no doubt, had a double motive in his visits there. But there was another and an earlier, which I will now explain. And then her story, my account, her story states that your sister's friend, the lady now staying with you, whom I have heard you mention, this is Mrs. Clay, Elizabeth's friend, came to Bath with Miss Elliot, Elizabeth, and Sir Walter as long as go as September, in short, when they first came themselves, and has been staying there ever since, that she is a clever, insinuating, so well, get under your skin and make herself familiar to you. Handsome woman, beautiful woman, poor and plausible. Plausible here means believable. And altogether such in situation and manner as to give a general idea among Sir Walter's acquaintance of her meaning to be Lady Elliot. So everybody thinks that Mrs. Clay is trying to seduce Sir Walter. And as general a surprise that Miss Elliot should be apparently blind to the danger. Everybody knows Mrs. Clay is trying to seduce Sir Walter. Except Elizabeth. Elizabeth has no idea. Um, the word insinuating, we also use this word differently today. The original meaning of the word sinew is muscle, like in the body. So insinuate is like getting into your skin, getting into your trust. Uh, but today to insinuate means to to make a negative in uh, a negative implication. An feng. Uh, yeah, to insinuate a message is to imply something that is negative. Uh, so why does Mr. Elliot now suddenly care about becoming uh, the heir to Kellynch Hall? Now you are to understand that time had worked a very material change. Material means substantial. In Mr. Elliot's opinions as to the value of a baronetcy. Upon all points of blood and connection, he is a completely altered man having long had as much money as he could spend, nothing to wish for on the side of avarice or indulgence. So he already is filthy rich. He doesn't need more money. He has been gradually learning to pin his happiness upon the consequence, the social status he is heir to. Um, and so that's why he suddenly came to apologize to Sir Walter why they are on such good terms.
Uh, then they discuss uh, Mrs. Clay. And finally, Mrs. Smith talks about what happened to her husband, how she found out about Mr. Elliot's true character. She, Anne, learned from Mrs. Smith that uh, the intimacy between them continuing unimpaired by Mr. Elliot's marriage. So even after Mr. Elliot married a rich lower class woman, he was still good friends with Mr. Smith. They had been as before always together and Mr. Elliot had led his friend into expenses much beyond his fortune. So Mr. Elliot's lifestyle was too expensive for Mr. Smith, but Mr. Smith went along anyways and lost all his money. Mrs. Smith did not want to take blame to herself and was most tender of throwing any on her husband. So the way that Mrs. Smith told this story tries not to blame herself or her husband. But Anne could collect, could see, that their income had never been equal to their style of living, and that from the first, from the very beginning, there had been a great deal of general and joint extravagance. Extravagance just means they spend a lot of money. From his wife's account of him, she could discern Mr. Smith to have been a man of warm feelings, easy temper, careless habits, and not strong understanding. <laughs> not a smart guy. Much more amiable than his friend Mr. Elliot, and very unlike him, led by him and probably despised by him. So it seems like Mr. Elliot just needed somebody to keep him company, but Mr. Elliot didn't even like Mr. Smith. Mr. Elliot, raised by his marriage, to great affluence, we're on page 139. To great affluence means great wealth. And disposed to every gratification of pleasure and vanity which could be commanded without involving himself. For with all his self-indulgence, he had become a prudent man. So Mr. Elliot, filthy rich, he's still wary, still careful enough to keep himself clean. So he's using Mr. Smith to do his dirty work. And beginning to be rich, just as his friend ought to have found himself to be poor, seemed to have had no concern at all for that friend's probable finances, but on the contrary, had been prompting and encouraging expenses, which could only end in ruin. And the Smiths, accordingly, had been ruined. The husband had died just in time to be spared the full knowledge of it. They had previously known embarrassments enough to try the friendship of their friends. So this means they already had sometimes spent so much money that they needed to ask their friends to borrow money. Try means test. And to prove that Mr. Elliot's had better not be tried. So they already knew that it is useless to ask Mr. Elliot for money. But it was not till Mr. Smith's death that the wretched state of his affairs was fully known. With a confidence in Mr. Elliot's regard, regard means respect, more creditable to his feelings than his judgment. Mr. Smith had appointed him the, ex ex the executor of his will. My God. So Mr. Smith, because he likes Mr. Elliot, not because he really understands Mr. Elliot, made Mr. Elliot the person to carry out his will after his death. Oh, just like... The Letting the fox into the hen house. But Mr. Elliot would not act. And the difficulties and distresses which this refusal had heaped on her, Mrs. Smith, 
in addition to the inevitable sufferings of her situation, had been such as could not be related without anguish of spirit or listened to without corresponding indignation. So the basic story is Mr. Elliot started out less rich than the Smiths. Then he married a lower class woman and became more rich and his lifestyle expenses increased and he dragged Mr. Smith along with him. And so Mr. Smith ran out of money just before he died. And Mr. Smith left behind a will and testament to be carried out by Mr. Elliot, but Mr. Elliot did not do shit about the will. And so they couldn't, uh, the Smith family couldn't pay off their debts, couldn't resolve their finances. Mrs. Smith could not use any spare money. And therefore she now has no money and she is sick and she's stuck in Bath, unable to move. All because Mr. Elliot would not deal with Mr. Smith's will. And like there's no good reason. It's simply because it's annoying. It's a lot of trouble to sort through a dead man's finances. So it's not Mr. Mr. Elliot doesn't deal with the will. Not because he hates Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith, simply because he thinks it's too annoying. He doesn't want to deal with it. And that is the source of Mrs. Smith's current situation. So yeah, a very evil guy. Going back to the question, if you remember, we're actually talking about a question. Uh, we only learn about Mr. Elliot's story from Mrs. Smith, and Mrs. Smith only learns this story because she is from a lower class and talks with Nurse Rook, who learns it from Colonel Wallace's wife, who learns it from Colonel Wallace, and Colonel Wallace is Mr. Elliot's friend. So it seems like the novel is saying that there is some value in having friends across class boundaries. If everybody in this story just stuck to their own class and would know nothing about any of this, she would still think that Mr. Elliot is a perfectly polite but passionless man. She would not know that Mr. Elliot is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So it, it seems like Jane Austen is saying, you know, it can be good to cross class boundaries. We shouldn't all uh, be so uh, arrogant about our class. Uh, question two, we already saw the evidence for this one. Why shouldn't you judge someone based on their private letters? Um, well, from the letter we do see, Mr. Elliot's letter to Mr. Smith, he says negative things about Sir Walter and the Elliot family. Um, but we also know that when actually dealing with Sir Walter in real life, Either Mr. Elliot just ignored them or he's very polite to them. He doesn't insult them to their face. And this gives us a hint. When you talk with different groups of people, you behave differently. You're willing to say different things to different people. When you talk with your friends, you're going to talk very differently than when you talk to me or when you talk to uh, our department chair or when you talk to our university president or when you talk to your parents or if you run into um, Lai Qingda in the street and you talk to him, right? You will always behave differently to different people. Writing a letter is talking to one person or sometimes one family. Therefore, when you write letters to different people, you will also write differently. You will say different things. You will uh, hide different things depending on who you're writing to. So there, the, the contents of the letter are connected to the intended recipient of the letter. The person and the content is connected. So if somebody else reads the letter, it's a completely different context. In this case, the context is Oh my God, look at the terrible stuff Mr. Elliot says when nobody knows he's talking. But in other situations, the context could lead to misunderstandings. 
It could lead to the disruption of plans. It could lead to the breaking up of friendships. We all have different thoughts about different people at different times, and we all know that you shouldn't say everything to everyone. And that's why it is a violation of the laws of honor to read a letter that is not meant for you. Uh, even today, um, like when you text your friends, I'm pretty sure you don't want the world to read what you're texting to your friends. Uh, so even today, this value is still in effect, basically. So like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of like in a court trial, somebody goes to court, gets sued or something, and they have to show their emails or they have to show their text messages. And it's always some really embarrassing stuff because it's not embarrassing when you say it to your friend, but it's embarrassing when somebody reads it in court. Um, so Anne at that moment is shocked that Mr. Elliot would say something like this. But then she remembers she's not supposed to be reading these letters. So it's like he did something wrong, but I also did something wrong. So they cancel out and I can't really feel that shocked. And then uh, she can go on talking with Mrs. Smith. The third question, let's go to page 147. So if you remember, this is near the last scene of the film. Uh, she and Wentworth and the Musgrove family, sorry, Anne and Frederick Wentworth and the Musgrove family are in the same room, but he did not seem to want to be near enough for conversation. So we have yet another very romantic dilemma. They're in the same room, uh, but it doesn't seem like they're going to talk. So Anne has to try to control her feelings. She tried to be calm and leave things to take their course, their natural course. Uh, and tried to dwell much on this argument of rational dependence. So she tries to calm down by thinking the following logical thoughts. Surely, if there be constant attachment on each side, our hearts must understand each other year long. If we both do still love each other, then sooner or later, we must understand that we love each other. We are not young anymore, easily annoyed or misled by twists and turns, willfully playing with our own happiness. So the idea is like the first time you fall in love, maybe it, the entire experience is new to you. You care a lot about the little details of your interactions with the other person. You read too much into everything. You are easily misled by every moment's inadvertence. And by believing in the power of this detailed so-called evidence, you get easily annoyed by the smallest things. Uh, and this kind of behavior, Anne says, is wantonly playing with our own happiness. You're risking your happiness based on these little details that in fact might not mean much at all. And Anne says this is the kind of love that young people have who are new to the experience of love. But now they are no longer boy and girl. So she's trying to convince herself. We're old enough, we're mature enough. We don't have to pay attention to these little details. We should, I, I should trust that if we do still love each other, we're going to find out sooner or later. So there's nothing to be worried or anxious about. And yet, a few minutes afterwards, she felt as if their being in company with each other under their present circumstances could only be exposing them to inadvertencies and misconstructions of the most mischievous kind. So even after trying to convince herself that they're mature, they're fine, she ends up still thinking, no, 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 we still have to be careful. Being in the same room together and 
like not talking. We're still going to have some twists and turns. We're still going to have misunderstandings. It's going to cause a lot of trouble. So going back to the question. Do you agree with Anne's thinking here? On the one hand, it is true. Once you have more experience in love, it's easier to convince yourself not to be so uptight and to give the other person more space and more freedom, not to care too much about the little details. On the other hand, the first half of this thought, if we do still love each other, we're going to find out sooner or later. Not true. It's not guaranteed. Right. It could be you like this person, the, uh, this person likes you, and because nobody says anything, you don't know. Which is, of course, their current situation. Um, and then finally, we probably shouldn't agree with this statement because Anne is trying to calm herself down. She's not saying this because she believes it, or she's not thinking this because she believes it. She's thinking this because she wants to believe it. So it's not likely to be true. It's likely to be good if true. So is it true? Maybe, maybe not. Not very convincing. And in fact, it even fails to convince Anne herself, right? As we just saw, even after thinking this, she still can't help caring about the small details. Um, and yet, as we know from the movie, the whole reason that they could express their feelings to each other is because of those small details. Anne knows that Wentworth still loves her because of his behavior at the concert. Small details. Later on, Wentworth learns that Anne still loves him because of the way she talks to, uh, I believe, Benick. Benick? Harville, because of the way she talks to Captain Harville by the window about whether men or women love the other person longer. Uh, and she says something like, um, women uh, will never forget the love that they have for the man of her life. And Wentworth realizes that means that Anne still loves him. So he learns the truth also by paying attention to small details. So, you know, when it says we shouldn't pay too much attention to these small details, the novel itself disagrees. Jane Austen herself disagrees. Uh, OK, question four, 164. Um, before that, let's see if we can take a look at that scene where Uh, Wentworth learns the truth. Here, um, page 155. They are talking about the fact that Benick, uh, I, who used to love Fanny Harville is now going to marry Louisa Musgrove. And uh, Captain Harville is like, uh, he, Benick really shouldn't have changed his, his love. Like now it makes me embarrassed, but I still want to argue that men love the longest. And Anne says, no, 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 women love longer. And, the, and they have a debate. And the last thing Anne says is, your feelings may be the strongest, but the same spirit of analogy will authorize me to assert that ours are the most tender. Man is more robust than women, but he is not longer lived, which exactly explains my view of the nature of their attachments. Nay, it would be too hard upon you if it were otherwise. You have difficulties and privations and dangers enough to struggle with. You are always laboring and toiling, exposed to every risk and hardship. Your home, country, friends, all quitted. Neither time, nor health, 
nor life to be called your own. It would be too hard indeed, and then here her voice falters, if woman's feelings were to be added to all of this. Wait, I think, I think that's one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> wrong paragraph, the previous paragraph. No, no, this is still Anne. No, no, it is not and uh, it is not man's nature. I will not allow it to be more man's nature than woman's. Hmm. That doesn't seem to be the right paragraph either. Well, it's somewhere near here, right? Well, no, that is the correct paragraph. The idea here is uh, Anne is saying men love stronger than women, more intensely than women. But because men have the world to deal with, all of these problems and these issues, they don't have the space to continue loving women as long as women could love men. Uh, and we know that Wentworth heard this because a slight noise called their attention to Captain Wentworth's hitherto perfectly quiet division of the room. So up to this point, Wentworth is sitting by the table. It was perfectly quiet. This is also a hint, right? He's writing a letter. He's using a quill. Uh, to write a letter. Quills are noisy. Have you ever used a quill before? Have you ever seen the Harry Potter movies? Quills are noisy. So when it says perfectly quiet, that's a hint to the reader that Wentworth was not writing. He was listening. But now uh, there is a sound. Okay, not a quill. I think it's like a fountain pen, gambi. But anyways, it makes a noise. Um, but now there's a sound. It was nothing more than that his pen had fallen down. So he's so surprised at what Anne says that he drops his pen. He's so surprised to learn that Anne still loves him that he drops his pen. Okay, okay, so that's it. Uh, next is page uh, 164. Uh, this is after they have uh, Anne has gotten back together with Wentworth, and they're thinking back over the past. And Anne says, I have been thinking over the past and trying impartially to judge of the right and wrong. I mean, with regard to myself. And I must believe that I was right, much as I suffered from it, that I was perfectly right in being guided by the friend whom you will love better than you do now. Uh, Lady Russell. To me, she was in the place of a parent. She was like my mother. Do not mistake me, however. I am not saying that she did not err in her advice. So Anne agrees she gave bad advice. It was perhaps one of those cases in which advice is good or bad only as the event decides. So was the advice bad or was it good? It depends on the consequence. And for myself, I certainly never should in any circumstance of tolerable similarity give such advice. So if I were Lady Russell, I would not give this advice to myself. But I mean that I was right in submitting to her and that if I had done otherwise, I should have suffered more in continuing the engagement than I did even in giving it up because I should have suffered in my conscience. I have now, as far as such a sentiment is allowable in human nature, nothing to reproach myself with, and if I mistake not, a strong sense of duty is no bad part of a woman's portion. So Anne is saying, thinking back, I still think I should follow Lady Russell's advice, 
even though that means that we separated for eight years and had to go through this whole thing this year in order to come back together. And the reason is because Lady Russell was giving honest advice. Lady Russell was not trying to trick her. She was giving what she thought was good advice. Now, was it really good advice? Turns out, maybe not. But Lady Russell could not have known that it would be bad advice. From the evidence that she had, she did the best that she could. Now, if Anne were in her situation, she would not give herself the same advice, but that's simply because Anne is a different person than Lady Russell. So, then Anne compares the situation. I followed her advice, suffered for eight years, but now we're back together. If I had not followed her advice, we would still be together, but I would suffer from guilt in not listening to Lady Russell, who is like a second mother to me. So in the end, I still think I did the right thing. And the question is, do you agree? If you think back to that situation, the reason Lady Russell wanted them to break up is because Wentworth didn't have money. How would he make money? By fighting successful battles on the sea, which is really a game of chance, right? He has to find the enemy, he has to win the battles, and he has to be uh, in the Navy long enough to do this enough times to make money. It's not guaranteed. So Lady Russell is a very proper woman. She cares a lot about the guaranteed happiness of Anne. So from her perspective, this was good advice. Uh, and as Anne says, she couldn't know the future. She could only be careful about uh, Anne, the possible futures of Anne. And Anne is saying, if I did not follow her advice and we ended up together, I would not be happy because I would be guilty. So yeah, I do, I do agree with her logic. I do think that makes sense. Um, and this is something that philosophers call moral luck. We try the best we can to make good decisions, but sometimes the, the result of our decisions is due to luck, something we cannot control, something we cannot predict. So this tells us we cannot simply use the results to determine whether it was a good choice. Because sometimes we had no control over the actually important factors. Let's take a short break.
Question five, the way the story ends for everyone in terms of morality, does it make sense? So let's go through these characters. Um, most people stay the same, or we already know their ending. Like Fennec marries Louisa, we already know this. Anne and Wentworth fall back in love together, and she joins him on his boat as he goes back out to sea, maybe to fight Napoleon again because Napoleon has come back. So they're together, that's happy, but they're going to war, that's maybe dangerous. And yet, when you're going to war with the man you love, it's not that bad a thing, right? It's something exciting that you're doing together. But it is interesting that uh, the, the novel ends on this kind of mixed emotion. I'll show you guys later. Uh, it's not 100% happy. Um, and then finally, let's see, who else? Lady Russell. Now that Anne is marrying Wentworth, Lady Russell has to reconfigure her feelings about Frederick Wentworth. But the novel tells us that she does this very quickly. She is a very practical and prudent woman. She accepts that they're going to marry, and so she adjusts her emotions accordingly. So the really interesting characters, the two interesting characters to think about are Mr. Elliot and Mrs. Clay, because they're the two people who have completely failed in their plans. Let's take a look at this, page 166. The news of his cousin Anne's engagement burst on Mr. Elliot most unexpectedly. It deranged, which today we would say it derailed, his best plan of domestic happiness, his best hope of keeping Sir Walter single by the watchfulness which a son-in-law's rights would have given. Oh my God. So not only was he planning to marry Anne, he was planning after joining the household to control Sir Walter and prevent Sir Walter from marrying anyone else. But though discomfited and disappointed, he could still do something for his own interest and his own enjoyment. Okay. He soon quitted Bath. He left Bath. And on Mrs. Clay's quitting it likewise soon afterwards and being next heard of as established under his protection in London, it was evident how double a game he had been playing and how determined he was to save himself from being cut out by one artful woman at least. So when Mr. Elliot leaves, he takes Mrs. Clay with him for main, two main reasons. One, to save himself from being cut out by one artful woman. So if Sir Walter had married Mrs. Clay and they had a son, then Mr. Elliot would not be the heir. So he at least is protecting his uh, retreat by preventing Mrs. Clay from producing a new son for Sir Walter. But the other reason is for his own interest and enjoyment. If he can't have Elizabeth, if he can't have Anne, at least he can have Mrs. Clay. Um, so at least there's still one woman in his bed. God, this guy. Mrs. Clay's affections had overpowered her interest. Interest here means uh, li yi, like what's good for her. And she had sacrificed for the young man's sake the possibility of scheming longer for Sir Walter. So why does Mrs. Clay go with Mr. Elliot? Because she actually loves him. That's surprising. She has abilities, however, as well as affections. And it is now a doubtful point whether his cunning or hers may finally carry the day. Whether after preventing her from being the wife of Sir Walter, he may not be wheedled and caressed in, at last into making her the wife of Sir William. 
So Mrs. Clay is also a cunning woman. Uh, so it looks like Mr. Elliot dragged Mrs. Clay away from Sir Walter. But it could also be that Mrs. Clay wants to seduce Mr. Elliot so that when Mr. Elliot inherits Kellynch, she automatically becomes uh, the new Lady Elliot. They're all playing the long game. Those are fun Yeah, yeah, yeah. It cannot be doubted that Sir Walter and Elizabeth were shocked and mortified by the loss of their companion, Mrs. Clay, and the discovery of their deception in her. They had their great cousins, to be sure, uh, Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, to resort to for comfort, but they must long feel that to flatter and follow others without being flattered and followed in turn is but a state of half enjoyment. So for Sir Walter and Elizabeth, they enjoy being socially important, but only if somebody can keep reminding them that they are socially important. They have to follow and flatter the higher ranked people, but they also want somebody to follow and flatter themselves. And now that Mrs. Clay is gone and Mr. Elliot is gone. They don't have that person. Uh, and then let's look at the ending. Last right, the end. We're at the end. Uh, so basically, they're all happy. Anne was tenderness itself. She was so happy that you could call her happiness. She was so in love that you could call her love. And she had the full worth of it in Captain Wentworth's affection. So Wentworth loves her equally. His profession was all that could ever make her friends wish that tenderness less. The dread of a future war, all that could dim her sunshine. So if her friends had any reason to wish that maybe they didn't love each other so much, the only possible reason could be because Captain Wentworth is in the Navy. And if anything could make her happiness slightly less, the only thing could be the possibility of a future war. She gloried in being a sailor's wife, but she must pay the tax of quick alarm for belonging to that profession, which is, if possible, more distinguished in its domestic virtues than in its national importance. So Anne enjoys being a sailor's wife, but she must always pay the price of whenever Captain Wentworth is called back to war, she must join him immediately. And then finally, Jane Austen adds a small insult to the Navy. She says that the Navy is more important domestically than nationally. In other words, uh, Navy sailors are more are seen to be more valuable than they actually are. People give them a high status, and this status is higher than their importance in defending the nation. And this is a really uh, ironic ending to this novel. It's, it's a romance, so you might expect the ending to be, oh, all love and sunshine and butterflies. But instead, Jane Austen ends the novel by saying, everything is fine unless there's a war. And then we will see that our sailors are more important as a status symbol than as actual fighting soldiers. Very strange ending. Uh, but it does preserve Jane Austen's famous wit and irony. If you read any of her other novels, uh, even when there's a happy ending, uh, Jane Austen always likes to use a little irony to poke fun at her characters and the, their uh, values and belief systems. So even here, at the happiest possible ending, she still has to add a little bit of irony. Um, and that adds to the realism. 
it makes it feel like it could be a story from your life. Okay, do you have other thoughts about these questions? If not, let's take a look at the final exam. Bum, bum, bum. Um, I want to remind you of these exam rules because some of you did not follow these rules during the midterm. Your answer must be an English essay with multiple non itemized paragraphs. It must be in English. It must have more than one paragraph. The paragraphs cannot be itemized. You can't say like number one, two, three. You cannot use bullet points. It must look like an essay. If the question has options, you must choose exactly one option. You cannot say, uh, depending on the evidence, it could be this, it could be that. You cannot say, people disagree. Some say this, some say that. You must choose one option. If you write your answer elsewhere and copy paste it into Moodle, please don't just give me the Google Docs link. Please give me the actual text of your answer. Somebody did do that. Give specific evidence from four different locations, not just four examples. Four examples, at least. One from uh, every example should be from a different part in the book. And not from the film. Evidence from the film does not count. It must be from the book. And give me the page number of the evidence. Tell me which page uh, you found the evidence from. Right, so those are the rules that most people, the most of the rule breakers did not follow in the midterm exam. So what do I mean by itemized? Here is a bad example answer. This is what you should not do. Subtitle colon, this is one item. Therefore, this essay is itemized. Subtitle and colon, subtitle and colon. This is not a, a complete essay. This is a list of ideas. It is not an essay. You will also notice that there are no location markers, no page numbers, no act numbers, scene numbers, line numbers, nothing. It's just ideas. So don't do that. Please give evidence from the book and give me the page number. Uh, and don't give me these subtitles, right? Turn it into a, a complete, coherent essay. Questions? OK, so let's look at the final exam question. The final exam will begin as soon as the bell rings. Answer one of the following sets of questions. One. How important do you think the theme of persuasion is in the plot of persuasion? If it's not that important, what's more important? And why? So it, throughout the novel, we've been saying like somebody has persuaded somebody else or they are of the persuasion that that's something, something. How important is this to the story of the novel? And if you think there's something else more important, what? Notice it says what is, not what are. So if your answer is that persuasion is not the most important thing, please give one thing or I guess one theme, Juti, that is more important in persuasion. And why? Question two, would you describe the novel as more like a realist novel or more like a sentimental novel? 
in Chinese, 写实跟感性小说 And why? You must answer either realist or sentimental, not both. Obviously, it is both, right? It is a realist novel and it is a sentimental novel. But which one is it more? Is it more realist or more sentimental? Uh, use the following definitions from Wikipedia. You don't have to use the entire definitions. A realist novel, quote, attempts to represent subject matter truthfully, avoiding science fiction and supernatural elements. Realist authors chose to depict everyday and banal activities and experiences. Banal means ordinary. Sentimental novels rely on emotional response, both from their readers and characters. They feature scenes of distress and tenderness, and the plot is arranged to advance both emotions and actions. The result is a valorization, which means uh, holding it up to be very important, of fine feeling displaying the characters as a model for refined, sensitive, emotional effect. Fine feeling is the idea that if you have strong and proper motion, uh, emotions for a situation, it is better than having no emotions or having the wrong emotions. The ability to display feelings was thought to show character and experience. Character here means good character. And to shape social life and relations. So is it more realist or more sentimental? Question three, please read this essay on the main Moodle page. The author says that Jane Austen fails to integrate the novel's two planes of reality. Which two realities? The first one is Anne's subjective experience. And the second one is the social comedy around her. Do you agree? Why or why not? If you agree, do you think this is a demerit? Why or why not? So if the author of this essay makes sense to you, if you do think the novel fails to integrate Anne's subjective experience, with the social comedy of the story. Is that a bad thing? Why or why not? Um, so there's a story behind uh, question three. Originally, we were going to do uh, one more week, or I planned another week, and then I decided not to do it. So this is the extra on the Moodle page. This is the essay, and I already prepared uh, five discussion questions. You can look at the discussion questions to help you understand the essay. It's not too long. It's a work of criticism. It's seven to eight pages. Seven and a half pages. It's not that, and it, most of it is the plot. It's a summary of the plot. Um, so if you're interested, you can take a look at that. And then the discussion questions. You can take a look at that. Uh, the exam question is number two. OK, so do you have questions about the final exam? OK, if not, I'm going to leave the rest of this class to you guys. You can start thinking about this, these questions. Uh, choose which one you want to answer. The deadline is midnight next Thursday. Uh, remember not to discuss with anybody else, but you can talk to me. OK, good luck.